Last week, I preached on Jesus. This is in a series on Jesus' last week on earth. Um, and last week, I preached on Mary, uh, the Mary that was uh, the, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, and how she came to Jesus to worship Jesus. Um, and today, I'm going to be preaching on worship again. I found as I begin looking at the last week of Jesus on earth, that just about everything he did that last week had to do with worship. I am 22,306 days old. Go wow. All right? And I, 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 I'm not going to count yours up. I might not have all the beads on the abacus to make that happen, but um, I'm 22,306 days old. If I, would, if I knew I had seven days left, what would my priority be? What would my mission be? And that's literally what it would be to complete the mission. Complete the task. Don't stop. Everybody says, well, I'd, just, I'd eat ice cream for a week. I'd be tempted to. Um, but then I'd get grumpy and my wife would get mad at me, so I, I wouldn't do that. Um, what would you do if you had seven days left? I was amazed by the fact that Jesus knew this was his last week and how often the things that happened in that last week had to do with worship. He was in Jerusalem. He was at the temple, which was supposed to be the one thing that pointed everybody to worship. So I thought since I preached over this last week, and I know my sermons are so rememberable that you've just been thinking about that sermon that I preached all week long. You just can't get it out of your mind, right? Don't lie, we're in church. But I thought, I want to begin the service, the, the looking into God's Word. And I want to challenge you right off the bat. This is the challenge. I'm going to pray. We'll read Scripture and we'll begin. I want you to make up your mind before God, not before me. I want you to make up your mind now that if the Holy Spirit speaks to you personally, the answer is yes. Is that fair? If God lay something on your heart. Let's just get the debate out of the way. Let's not worry about, well, I don't know how I, I want to, I don't want to, I need to, I don't know about today. Can we just get out, that out of the way? If the Lord speaks to your heart, will you promise Him now before His Word speaks that the answer is yes? Let's pray. Lord, we come. All is vain if you don't come. We know you're here, but we want the manifest presence of God to, to take your word and highlight it in our life, to draw us to yourself. Lord, we know that we can't approach you, but you approach us. And when you approach us, we need to react to that. And I pray that right now, that we would settle it in our heart. That, Lord, if you speak to us personally, it's because you love us. It's because you want what's best for us. And, Lord, may we just settle it in our hearts and minds now that if you speak, yes, sir, the answer is yes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, let's look in God's Word, and we're going to begin in Luke 19, verse number 45. Luke 19, a story you've probably heard many times. The Bible says this, Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sowed in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching 
daily in the temple, but the chief priest describes the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Praise God that they were attentive to hear him. In Matthew's gospel, this is in the 21st chapter, and it's in verse number 12. God's Word says this, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who sowed doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind, the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Can you think about that? They came in need. They came with a need that no man could meet. But when they went to the place of God, they found that the need that they had that no one else could meet, God was willing to meet. That's what I pray. That the need that you have that no other man can meet, you will find today that God is not only able but willing to do exactly that. Verse 15, when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. He quotes here Psalms chapter 8, verse 2. Have you never heard out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? And he left them, went out to the city of Bethany, and he lodged there. And then in Mark's account of this. It's in Mark chapter number 11 in verse number 15. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And he taught, saying to them, Is it not written? This is a quotation of Isaiah 56, verse 7. Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? And then he quotes Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teachings. And when evening had come, he went out of the city. There's two things I think we need to talk about today that are highly important to Christ, and they need to be highly important to us. And the first one is this, the priority, the priority of worship. When they came to the temple, they came to worship. That's what, you, that's what Jerusalem was known for. Solomon's temple was there. Nebuchadnezzar tore it down. Herod's, Herod rebuilt the temple. It had been about 40 years since the beginning of that. And uh, actually about 60 years after the beginning of that, building of that. And now they're there in that place. And it was called a place of God or a house of God. We call this, sometimes people say, this is the church. These walls are not the church. We're the church. The people are the church. But they recognize the place. New Holland meets in that place. We are the people of New Holland. This is where we come together to meet. And, and every Sunday, you vote with your feet. You vote to desire to come to the house where the people of God meet and worship, or you decide to do something else. But literally what this place should be, should be, is an oasis in the middle of this desert that we live in where someone who is thirsty 
can come and get a clean, clear drink of water that will satisfy their thirst. That's what this place is. When people drive by and they see our building, I don't know what they think. You that have come today, I'm not sure all the things that were going in to your life when you came to this place today. This place is a place of God. It's a place of teaching the Word of God. It's a place of encouragement. It is a place where we can be discipled to be like Christ and we can offer sacrifice. You come, someone, uh, I was in the back when someone came in, they say, our offering? And I said, put it right there. Thank them for doing it. But folks, I'm not talking about simply our money. You've sacrificed your time. You could have been doing something else. You sacrificed <clears throat> a lot of things to separate yourself to God today. And I truly pray that in the next few moments that that's what we will do is separate our thoughts to God that we would come and connect with Him. Because worship is when sinful men get the opportunity to connect with the Holy God. And people in need can connect with the one who can satisfy their needs. And people who lack can come and find help from the one who lacks nothing. And people who don't understand can come to the one who has all the wisdom, who will share his wisdom that I pray will be shared plainly and openly to you today. But understand, we are the one that God wants to inhabit. We are the body of Christ. We are the temple. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, the Word of God says this, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? If you're a Christian, who is in you? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. We belong to God. He is God. We are not. He is love. We need love. He is perfect. We need forgiveness. He is holy, separated, and we need to come to Him. He's there. He's a whisper away. He's close. At the beginning of this, and I said, well, if, if God speaks, are you willing to say yes? I want to say it this way. If, if God knocks at the heart, your heart's door, are you ready to open the door and let Him in? Revelation chapter 20, verse three, uh, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 20 says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do y'all know what it means when God knocks? Have you ever felt him knock before? You know it's him. Nobody else has to point. You know, and you know that he's speaking to you. And he's there, he's right at the door. And he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Praise God, hallelujah. We have a God that, will, that, that does not see it as a big deal to leave the portals of glory and enter the heart of a sinful man to make us clean forevermore. Praise God. Anybody in here in need? Anybody in here in need for another drink? Anybody in, need, need, in here in need for love? A love that satisfies? A love that's perfect and complete? That's the priority of worship. God wants to meet with you. But I want to share a second thing. I, I call it the obstacles to worship. The obstacles. Now, let me describe the temple that Jesus walked into that day. I'm going to describe it from the inside out. In the inner court there, there was a place called the, the Holy of Holies. Only the priests could go in. And there inside the Holy of Holies, there was a curtain that surrounded three uh, things that were most precious there. 
And the priest could go in once a year where the Ark of the Covenant was and, and, and the mercy seat was, and he could take the blood of the sacrifice and he could offer it there for the sins of the people once a year. Outside of that, the priest could be there. Then there was the uh, inner court where Jews were allowed to come in. Then one step out on the outside part where the walls were was called the court of the Gentiles. And this was Passover week. And people would come to observe the Passover. You remember when they were in Israel, the children of Israel were in Israel, and they took the blood of the lamb, the perfect lamb, took the blood, put it over the lintels of the door. And if they did that, the plague of God, the death angel, when he came and he saw the blood had been applied, he would pass over. If the blood was not there, the oldest child would be killed. This was celebrated to the Jewish people. It was a most holy holiday. And this was the Passover, all about redemption, all about salvation. And they come. So people, Jewish people would come. Every family would come with a lamb or a dove. If you could not afford a lamb, you were allowed to bring a dove. And, and they would bring it there. Now, people from all over the world came. Now, this is what happened. Please hear this well for the next couple minutes. If you were traveling a long way, you, you had to have a perfect lamb. It had to have no spot, no blemish. Now, you wouldn't want to have to travel 100 or 200 miles or maybe even further and, and keep this lamb safe so that you could present it to the priest at the temple. And there were times, if you brought the lamb there, that they would look it over, and if they found a flaw, they'd give it back to you and say, no, 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 this is not a perfect lamb. It's not appropriate to give to God. So what people would do is they would buy a lamb at the temple or buy a dove, right? They had certified lambs and doves. Literally what they would do, the priests who would keep these up, they would, they would put a stamp on it for approval so that you could offer the sacrifice that you deserve. Now, they would only let you use temple script. So when you came, let's say you're from, somebody came and give me a name of a country over yonder. Amen. Say again. Damascus was a city, but let's say from, the, from that area of Samaria where Damascus was, and they came with the money from that area, and they could not go to the temple and use that kind of money, okay? They would have to uh, exchange it for temple script, okay? Uh, Ken, your wife is in Honduras. I wrote this down because I'm not smart enough to remember it. Uh, they call them Lempira. That's the money in Honduras. Now, if she goes down there and she's working with children and she's doing the medical thing, taking care of kids, and praise God for people who serve on tri mission trips. Amen? Amen? She's got a dollar down there and she wants Coca-Cola. They have Lampiras. So what is she going to do? Somewhere in there, she's going to have to take her dollars and she's going to have to exchange them for Lampiras so she can get a Diet Coke. Does that make sense? Or something somewhere along the way. Now, <clears throat> exchange rates change. It's all based on the good faith of whoever's doing it. Now, do you think during Holy Week at the temple, the exchange rate might have got a little exorbitant? What you could get the week after Passover might have been up to, listen to me now, 10 to 15 or even 20 times the rate for that week. For that week. You know what that's called? Profiteering. Profiteering, that's a good word. What, what else? Extortion, that's a good word. Can I get another? A rip-off, I like it, plain talk. <laughs> Cheating at the temple. And Jesus walks into the temple in the outer court where the Gentiles were, this was the place, come on, where the Gentiles were supposed to come worship. And it looked like a stockyard. Oxen, sheep, doves, crooks over here. I mean, uh, what do we call them? Rip-off artists? 
and they've got their tables and you come in and says, can I buy a lamb? Well, I can't do that. Go over there and exchange your money and, and then come back and see me. And then do you think those lambs, the, the, the price went up too? You better believe it. One scholar said this. Now, for the poor people, they wanted to bring something for their family too. And God made a way for this. He said, just, just don't worry about a lamb. Just get a dove. Just a dove. It would be like a half a shekel during the week before. But it would cost you 10 shekels 20 times that week. When Jesus walked in and he saw this, people coming in, like today, we've got a clean building. Can I get an amen? Air conditioner, can I get an amen? I know some of y'all are mad. For some of y'all, it's too hot in here. For some of you, you're freezing to death. When you get to heaven, you'll have your own thermostat. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Amen? But we got air conditioning. We got clean. Uh, praise God for padded pews. How many of you remember wooden pews? Woo! The preacher would wax eloquent and it was hard to endure. They went in to worship and smelled a stockyard instead of the sweet aroma of God. How loud was it? The baying of the sheep, the talk of the people, the exchangers. And Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, it tells us in John 2, at the very beginning of his ministry, he went in and got a cord put together and started running the animals out of the temple and said, he said the same quote, my house is to be a house of prayer, reverence, worship. Look what you've made of it. This time, he didn't deal with the sheep. He goes to the ones who do the extorting and he begins to kick over their tables. Why did he do that? Their money went everywhere. Because their priority was money. We allow a lot of obstacles between us and worship. I love Mark's account of this. Because when Mark reads this, he says, my house is to be called a house of prayer for all nations. And what did the Gentiles get? It wasn't much of a place of worship, was it? You know, it feels bad to be left out. You ever felt left out? Not important. Overlooked. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, I, I come to church, I just don't have the clothes for it. And then somebody will say, we're supposed to wear our Sunday best. I'm still looking for the place in the Bible that says that. Because really, God doesn't look on the outside. God looks at the... Your heart's what matters to Him. Well, I'd be embarrassed I don't have an offering to bring. You think the God who owns everything, who created everything, is worried about getting more money? Man talks more about money. That would have been a good place for an amen. Y'all missed it. God cares about when you come and bow the knee before Him. Hold on. God cares about it when you have no idols. when you come and offer anything and everything for Him. So let me ask you, is there a problem uh, with our worship? Is there a problem with our time? Is that an obstacle? I'm 22,306 days old. Uh, I, I wish I had worshipped more. How many of y'all get 24 hours a day? Now, hold on. Some of you think you stretch it to 28. You're fooling yourself. Some of you think you only have three. You're fooling yourself. We come an hour a week or an hour and a half when I'm preaching. That would have been a good place to say amen too. <laughs> and we can't give an hour. 
We can't give an hour. We can't bow our knee before God at home for 10 minutes. He is so important. And, and I need to know more. And I'm, I don't have very much understanding, but I know the one who does. And the thing is, is when I open this book, he speaks to me personally. And when I bow my heart and I talk, he listens. Isn't that an amazing thing? A God who created the world, eight billion people on this earth, he knows every hair on their head, every thought in their heart. And when I bow my heart before him, I have his undivided attention. Wow, what an amazing God we serve. But we let so much clutter. Y'all got clutter? Have y'all seen that TV show, Hoarders? Could you imagine people live like that? But hold on. Between us and God, how much have we hoarded from this world that is basically, come on, listen to me, worthless? And we fill our life, our body, our hearts with worthless. And we can't make a little room for Him. I've been saved for 50 years. I haven't been all that I should have been for 50 years. But He's been everything He wanted to be, He needed to be, and I needed for me. He has never left me. He has forgiven me. My sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west, and He keeps reminding me of that. He loves me with an everlasting love. He allows me to, to be on mission for Him in a world of darkness. It, it's a desert out there, and people need a drink, and I get the opportunity to point them to where the true fountain really is. What have we done? How we have perverted our worship. Somebody texted me last week when I was talking about worship and they said, you stepped on my toes. I pray that today we hear the God of, the, God of the universe calling us to His presence that we would value nothing like we value Him. Hebrews chapter 4.16 says this. Y'all ready? Let us, y'all good with us? Because of these things, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. When you come before God, you don't have to do this. I know I don't deserve. He's like, come on in. Please, come in. Can we, do you have some time? Can we talk? And we can just find the place of grace. We can find a place at the feet of Jesus. Grace is what you receive that you do not deserve. Would y'all like to get to the feet of Jesus today and receive that which is God's best for you? You don't have to pay for it. It's paid for. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But oh, how He wants to give it. He wants to bless you with it. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Grace is what you receive that you do not deserve. Mercy is what you do not receive that you do deserve. Anybody ever messed up? And you know you messed up? 
And you know there's a penalty for that. But God says, don't worry about that. It's paid for, taken care of, it's been covered. Your debt, your bill has been paid. I'm not going to penalize you. Let me just give you grace. And find grace to help in time of need. Is anybody in here expecting that when we leave this place that there will be difficulties and hardships and problems and troubles? Is everybody going to love you when you leave? You live in a world of... Does anybody have bills? Do they come every month? Come on. How many of y'all like to eat? Amen. Praise God. Now some of you... Have, some of y'all got grace because you've already been to the red truck. <laughs> Those who are online going, what in the world's that about? Come to church and you'll find out. I mean, praise God for the red truck because there's grace given away every week. But some of y'all are going to go out to eat today for Father's Day. Kids? Pay the bill. I won't let mine. Um, but trust me, there are bills that come. When you leave this place, you're going to come short. You're going to be tapped out. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be stressful. You're going to have anxiety. And you can leave all that behind. Because the one who promised to keep you will take care of you. People ask me, why don't more people worship? Why don't more people come to Christ? You know, I'm not too, I'm not too sure. I think all the obstacles get in the way. Pride. How's your pride going to feel when you're standing before God and you never give Him your heart and life? You never let Jesus Christ become your Savior and Lord. You can't be a recipient of grace because you never received it. What's it going to be like to live in deficit forever and ever and ever? I'm just stating it. That's the truth, isn't it? I mean, we're, we, we have a life on this earth, and this life's going to come to an end. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Unless you have a Savior who can forgive you and cleanse you, when your soul moves out into eternity, you're either going to spend your eternity with God or separated from God. And in the with God part, it's good, and it's perfect, and it's holy, and it's wonderful. It is going to be fun. But if you're away from everything that is good and godly, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Come on. You want to spend your eternity away from that? Why should you reject such great salvation? But people do it all the time. And God will let you make that choice. If you don't want forgiveness, the cross of Calvary's already been done. You just don't have to receive the blessing that comes from Calvary. But if you so do, I wish I had gotten saved 50 years ago the first time the Holy Spirit called. But He gave me another chance. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior and Lord, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, many of you made a pledge at the beginning of this that you would say yes. Whatever he said, you would say yes. And your life of walking with God, whatever he's spoken to you, I pray that you'll honor that request. And whatever he said to you, you'll say yes. But if you're here today, and I know some are, and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, will you say yes? 
All you have to do is talk to the Lord. From your heart to His heart, He'll hear you. Tell Him you believe in Him. Tell Him you know that He's God's Son that came to earth, that He died on the cross of Calvary for your sins, that though He was buried, He was resurrected three days later. Then you need to come to where you've fallen short. You need to tell Him, I know I've sinned. And I know I need forgiveness. Then ask Him to do exactly that. Come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of my sin. It's amazing how simple it is. God doesn't make it complicated. My brother was five years old when he got saved. If you'll pray that prayer and ask Him to forgive you, He'll come into your heart. He'll forgive you of your sins. And you can become what we know as a follower of Christ. All your life you give to Him. And you'll be saved. How many times have you all heard me say this, church? You'll be saved to the uttermost. I don't know all that that means, but I'm very grateful for it. I just wonder if you're willing to make that decision today.